This is Parasitology Seminar for Thursday, February 11th, 2021. Uh, the title is Thinking Like a Parasitologist. Uh, I might comment that the ideas that you're getting ready to hear about are ones really that I've used in the large introductory classes for decades while, while I was teaching. Namely, the, uh, involving the use of local materials, plants and animals that are readily available to students uh, without having to be ordered from some uh, supply house or backed up with a, an animal care protocol approved, that sort of thing. So uh, the, uh, the think like a parasitologist part, however, is derived quite a bit from this last summer's experience of being invited to participate uh, as, a, as a sort of an interested outsider in Scott Gardner's field parasitology class, which was taught um, virtually uh, with him working at Cedar Point, but students from really almost all over the country doing field projects and doing their own work and their own research and their own activities like a parasitologist in their own hometowns and that worked that really worked pretty well uh, and these ideas are also derived from additional conversations with a couple of parasitologists in other parts of the country uh, about the problem of trying to teach parasitology uh, virtually in a pandemic time. So what do parasitologists see when they're just simply walking around their neighborhoods? And of course we're assuming that they have neighborhoods with some kind of vegetation in them. But uh, the answer is they see a lot and if you're an old parasitologist like, like I am uh, you really see a lifetime of experience but the idea then is to try to uh, trans transfer this lifetime of experience uh, into the mind of, of a, uh, an undergraduate student. So what do parasitologists see when they're walking around the neighborhood? Um, I thought as an example to illustrate that I just plucked out all, uh, well, a bunch of the photographs of local wildlife that I took um, in our yard uh, at 420 more than Sycamore Drive in Lincoln, Nebraska during April and May of 2020. Uh, there are some others of course but these are the ones that sort of fit on the screen. Um, the fox however was taking that picture in our front yard but it came running out of the back so I guess it sort of um, qualifies as at least temporary backyard fauna. What are these animals? Uh, and we start by asking, what are their what are their scientific names? And so I'll start with the birds. And all of this uh, this list of scientific names really comes from the uh, integrated taxonomic information system uh, that you can pull up online pretty easily. Uh, although they could also come out of a bird book of any kind, or really straight off of Google if you know the common names. So there are a bunch of them. Uh, one of the things you figure out in a hurry is that Linnaeus, who really, to my knowledge, never came to this country, uh, actually got his hands on specimens or material or pictures, in the case certainly of blue jays, to, uh, to make those species descriptions. Uh, the Itis reference lists uh, Turtus migratorius, uh, American robin, as a 1766 description date, which is, I found a little curious, uh, thus the question mark. So there are the birds, and here are the mammals. Uh, I'd like to thank Scott Gardner for uh, pointing out that the, uh, the little prey item in the clutches of that, of that uh, owl uh, was a short-tailed shrew. So here's the stuff that I actually have seen in our backyard. Now the raccoons in the uh, feral house cat are uh, pretty much nightly visitors in our yard and when I put the trail camera out I, I catch them pretty regularly. So what do we do with these observations? How do we convert them into some kind of a 
teaching and learning experience uh, without us uh, as parasitologists actually being there in the same room with those students. So the first question you ask or the first assignment you have that can be done again on almost anywhere in the world, choose your host and find out what kinds of parasites it might have. This is not very difficult. Um, However, uh, it does help if you're a college student and have access to your university's uh, library databases like uh, JSTOR and Biosys Citation Index and so forth. So choose your host and find out what parasites you have. Quite frankly, this first idea of asking a student to choose a subject uh, that they will work on now for a while, that they will invest their time and talents in. This is quite different from what goes on in a normal large auditorium introductory course. Uh, mainly because instead of me telling them what to, what to learn and what to use for study material, they're doing it themselves. This is probably the first and foremost and most obvious lesson that you learn in places like Cedar Point or a field station where you ask your student, where you tell them that they're going to have to do uh, a research project of some kind. Now make a choice. And quite frankly, that student choice really conveys a sense of possession. In other words, this is my endeavor, and it's not my endeavor between now and when I have to answer some multiple choice questions next week, but it's actually my endeavor for, as it's going to turn out, for my whole lifetime. So I own this activity. This is my research project, even though I'm doing it all virtually. Uh, now, a, a simple sort of an assignment, a little writing assignment that I've given for years, not necessarily with robins, but with all kinds of stuff, including campus vegetation, explain why I chose this object of my interest. Why did I choose it? And go ahead and do that explanation in three typed double space pages. However, if you once mention health, agriculture, money, politics, sex, sports, or religion, then you get a chance to do it over without once mentioning those. Now, what I find is that first paragraph of three pages is really pretty easy to generate, but the next, uh, uh, the next two and two and a half or so pages are where the education comes and where the thinking process comes and where the student um, ends up sort of uh, examining really an, a, an object of study in a way that they have not examined it before. Student choice conveys a sense of possession and at the end of this little exercise uh, explaining why I did something and why you do it and why you did not do something else this is a really a pretty empowering exercise of the mind. And it's also the kind of thing that scientists do all the time. Uh, they do it when they uh, write a grant proposal. They do it when they write a scientific paper. Uh, they do it really as part of their general um, behavior as a scientist. So what we're really asking a student to do is do what we do, but do it at your level with the material that's readily available to you in your backyard or a local city park or maybe somewhere else. Now, because this is parasitology, we're going to ask what kinds of parasites are in a robin since I chose that robin. Well, the list is pretty long, and I got this list out of the index catalog, which is available online. Uh, I happened when I uh, got rid of um, uh, my series. However, I saved the host volumes and the host supplements. So I got this list pretty quickly out of the paper version of, of those. But uh, you can get the same thing uh, online. And actually, for a student with access to library databases, the Biosys Citation Index 
will turn up uh, a, a long, long list just about like this. Um, I haven't checked on the validity of any of these things, any of these names. I just plucked them directly out of the index catalog. So there's a lot of material here to work with. Uh, these are scientific names, but remember that a scientific name gives you access to the primary literature. It also gives you access to uh, all of the literature that might pop up, all of the websites that might pop on pop up on on Google, as we'll come to sort of at the end of this talk. Here are some parasites of the American robin continued. So they have a lot of them. They have protozoans that live inside their red blood cells. They have um, nematodes, roundworms. They have ticks. They have mites. They have tapeworms. They have um, flukes. They have uh, all kinds of stuff in them. There's a lot of material to work with from one species of bird, <coughs> one species of host from your backyard, and uh, especially if you have access to these library databases. So I'm going to ask again that the student do an exercise uh, of, of choice that involves quite a bit of choice. Uh, I plucked out three, ex a couple of examples of genera with three species on that list. And I'm going to ask a student answers two fundamental questions in biology using these species as material. And of course these two fundamental questions in biology can be applied to any group of, uh, of living organisms and actually they can be applied to almost any area of life whether you know it be all of those uh, all of those uh, subjects that were denied when we wrote our first three pages. So in what ways are these species similar in spite of their differences? In what ways are these species different in spite of their similarities? Um, in this specific case, uh, you'll discover right away that Capillaria contorta is a veterinary issue, uh, and there is a lot of material online, including uh, from agricultural websites on Capillaria contorta. You'll also discover that the uh, original descriptions of those other capillary species are behind a paywall and that's kind of frustrating. So uh, nevertheless if you've chosen you know you could get into some of this uh, pretty easily. However if you take those same fundamental questions in biology and apply them to the whole list uh, by picking out any two or three of those reported species as material then suddenly this mental exercise gets very interesting indeed and highly educational because you'll end up um, comparing life cycles, you'll end up comparing means of, of um, transmission, you'll end up uh, comparing all kinds of uh, ways structurally, uh, and you'll learn a lot of anatomy. In fact, you, you'll learn anatomy that you might have been um, asked to um, deal with on a parasitology exam in an in-person class, but you'll learn it for your own reasons and by following your own interests. So the reward, this is sort of the second principle involved, the reward is in the investment as opposed to an answer. So by the time this student or any student has finished answering those two fundamental questions, uh, then they can use primary literature, they can identify birds, they can draw structures of the parasite, they can converse about life cycles and geographic distributions, uh, they can write their nice papers and they can write them over again if they mention any of those subjects, and also um, they can impress their ignorant friends, and they can do a whole lot of other stuff uh, with uh, with the information that they've picked up. So the reward is in the investment and that's exact, That's a principle that professional scientists re use. I mean they live that all the time by investing in their careers and that's the same principle that's really at work uh, in any uh, uh, area of endeavor that's taken, taken seriously. The individual reward is in the investment of your time and your talents the most valuable things that you own. 
So now we get to uh, the question of who else is in this genus Turtus. Uh, keeping in mind that the word Turtus really is Latin for thrush. And it doesn't take very much time uh, online to figure out that there are a lot of members of this genus and they don't all look like American robins. So here's a quick sample. Uh, however, if you go to the itis page, you discover right away that there are 80 species in this genus. And so now we can begin to ask, where do they live? How do they behave? What kind of parasites do they have? Uh, do they have the same kind of parasites in uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, that they have in Lincoln, Nebraska? Uh, and who studies these things? Uh, and are they endangered? and who described them throughout history, what are their common names, uh, the list of, of uh, information that you sort of accumulate in your mind, uh, turning you into a richly educated individual, that sort of information uh, comes in a hurry and, and it comes in large amounts. Well, uh, here's really a sampling. Uh, when I look at this picture, my first reaction is, oh, I'm seeing adult birds that have what look like Nebraska robin uh, fledgling uh, color patterns and spot patterns. So is there, is there some neoteny that I'm seeing? Neoteny being the retention of, of immature characters into the adult stage. And so here's a whole idea of uh, uh, that's present throughout biology in a lot of ways and a lot of uh, areas that is uh, is one that can easily be explored uh, again intellectually. So simply by uh, answering the question who else is in the genus Turtus, uh, suddenly you realize the importance of, of uh, knowing something about your hosts in order to really have to understand the parasitism. And I think that uh, our host for the seminar, <laughs> Scott Gardner, is a, is a superb example of that because he is really a professional mammalogist and has described new species of mammals uh, as well as new species of parasites. So that's a, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a local down-home case of uh, of being an expert on your host in order to really understand your parasites uh, and vice versa. So here are students saying, well, maybe I'll take an ornithology course. And, you know, as dumb as it may sound to a, a non-parasitologist, you really can't understand parasitism until you know something about the host. And I think that that last lesson, this last lesson is one that we have learned um, with COVID-19 over and over and over again uh, as, uh, the, what, as the hosts and the potential hosts, some of those in positions of uh, substantial power uh, have, have uh, spread stupidity and ignorance and uh, naivete and scientific illiteracy uh, throughout the land and carried along with it uh, the virus. Well, uh, one of my experiences as a graduate student involved uh, one of the faculty members at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Harley Brown. And at some point in Harley's uh, life, he inherited a substantial amount of money. So what did Harvey do with that big windfall? He went to Europe, uh, he and his wife went to Europe, he bought a Volkswagen bus and he traveled all over Europe collecting uh, uh, riffle beetles, which were one of his favorite animals, uh, the Elmadie. And he ended up then being a global expert on the uh, taxonomy of riffle beetles just because he ended up getting a big bunch of money to do it. So let's imagine you just won Powerball. You won a biggie. So now you can spend the rest of your life making sense of the parasite fauna of the genus Turtus. You can get a pretty good start 
on this just by using the online databases that are available in the library. And what you'll discover is that you need to update your passport in a hurry and you need to figure out the ways to get to places on earth that you may not be welcome and may not be safe to go and may not even be accessible. And uh, however, I, you're going to have to do it or try to do it or at least do it with your imagination. So simply by choosing uh, an animal, a host species, out of the fauna of your local community and doing these mental exercises with that and using the available online resources, and again, if you're, certainly if you're an enrolled college student, then you end up getting an education, at least in part, in zoogeography, distribution of animals, ornithology, you're going to ask yourself constantly about pattern formation in birds because uh, they have, <laughs> even though these are obviously thrushes and robins in, in their body proportions, uh, they are really very different looking. Taxonomy, taxonomy and nomenclatural history, you'll get into that up to your eyebrows. Uh, who are the people who have actually done the research throughout the last uh, 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 centuries, really, since 1758? Who, who, have, who are these folks? Where did they come from? Are they famous? Uh, did they do a one-time description of some parasite and then disappear from the literature? What were their lives like? How did they do their work? How did they get around? Uh, You'll uh, right away come up against the, um, the, the, the big issue or problem in parasitology, and that is the evolution of life cycles. Uh, you become a comparative anatomist. Um, <clears throat> you'll uncover a whole lot of unsolved problems. And if you're a teacher, um, just by doing these exercises, you'll uh, end up with a whole lot of teaching material in a course like... Uh, uh, really much, if not most, of biology, there are a lot of cultural associations with your host material, uh, especially uh, when you're talking about birds. So let's finish then with a little bit of, of cultural association. And I did that by just doing some Google searches. So what happens if you do a Google search uh, just on the term thrush birds. Uh, now, if you just do thrush, then you're going to get that uh, infection of, of children and throat and so forth. So, narrow it down to thrush birds. Well, you get seven and a half million hits in a little over half a second. So, there's a lot of quick information. Um, and uh, some of it, of course, is good, and some of it is maybe not, but there's a lot of stuff to deal with. If you add the word music to thrush birds music, you get almost a million hits again in three quarters of a second. Um, if you add literature, thrush birds to literature, you get about two and a half million second uh, hits again in a little over half a second. And if you add art, thrush birds art, uh, you get over three million hits uh, again in a little less than a second. So there is a lot of quickly accessible material available for anyone to become broadly educated with transferable ways of thinking just by choosing a host, looking for the information available on parasites in that host, and then trying to understand not only the host, but the way humanity has viewed and used those hosts in all of its um, other activities beyond science. And by way of uh, illustrating that last point, here's my favorite. Sing a song of sixpence, pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. Uh, and of course those blackbirds are Turdus merula, the European blackbird, and uh, if you've been to Europe and walked around in a park uh, during the spring or summer, You've seen these blackbirds and they behave exactly like robins. And you look at those and you think, you know, that bird's behaving just like a robin. And sure enough, there's a very good reason why that is. And they're in the same genus.
and they probably taste great too. I didn't really look at uh, thrush birds in recipes, but maybe that's maybe that's uh, the next exercise. Uh, that's about all of my seminar. Um, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Um, I'm not sure um, that I'm an expert in all of those parasites, and I know that I'm not an expert in some of them. And I know that I know some of them better than others, um, and I haven't really done all my ornithology on the genus Turtus, but I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thanks.